Hello, my name is Hugh Patterson, and I am the C Coalition for Networked Information Doctoral Fellow for 22-23 year. Um, I was asked to share a bit about my research agenda, and so I'm here excited to share um, the work that I've been doing and uh, some of the, the goals that I have and why I'm doing those. Uh, so I want to start off by just saying thank you for supporting me and advancing uh, the scholarly activities that I've been involved with. And it's because of this fellowship that I've been able to do the things that I've been doing this year. And I really appreciate that. Uh, the title of my uh, talk today is uh, Enriching Library and Archival Records with Ethnolinguistic and Minority Language Identification. Uh, and this is a a theme uh, of my research area. My educational background has been a linguist. This is my first year as a PhD student, uh, and I'm a PhD student in information science at the University of North Texas. Um, so this year, uh, in terms of scholarly activities, uh, I've taken a couple of courses, some uh, on on cataloging where we covered topics like MARC and the IFLA LRM model, uh, BibFrame and RDA, Metadata 1 and Metadata 2, or we've talked about uh, VRA Core, Dublin Core and MODS, and RDF and Linked Data. And I've also been able to do a practicum at the University of Oregon's Knight Library, where um, I've been involved with discussions on uh, institutional repository infrastructure. Uh, through this academic year, I've had about 18 academic and professional presentations, such as conference uh, presentations, with three accepted publications. I've been busy, but uh, my family and my kids keep me busy, too. Uh, and I, I rarely mention my kids in my professional work, but I think in this context, they inform my research curiosities. In cultural heritage preservation, we hope that new generations will engage with resources that inform them about the past, and we hope that they will use uh, those resources to shape the future. My kids provide me an everyday example of new learning and knowledge assimilation. So they give me a laboratory of, of uh, new and, and uh, cross-generational information transfer. So it's invigorating to watch them discover the world in new ways, including the use of language. Language, I think, is the metadata of life. It provides indicators for relationship, for community, vitality, for individual and communal prospering. Um, there are over 7,000 languages used around the world each one uh, with one or more ethno-linguistic communities using those languages. Uh, when it comes to language resource discovery, uh, resources you know, about language or demonstrating language, uh, and the acquisition of those resources that are useful for a community to take its next steps in language development. We're talking about many of the smaller communities around the world where maybe there's under 40,000 speakers. And that's the long tail of languages. There's a, a few languages, billions of speakers, or a couple of languages with millions of speakers, and then there's this long tail. Uh, so talking about how language and language resources are engaged with, with uh, in these smaller population communities, uh, I want to see those types of communities flourish and their cultural heritage stewardship and language development goals reached and, and the resourcing of those efforts. Uh, information access is a big part of enabling flourishing of ethno-linguistic communities, but discovery tools and pathways to resources are the methods used to lead people into those resources. That's why I get involved with projects in the digital library spaces and with projects in user experience design or discovery. And because those components help give access to and facilitate and, and uh, encourage uh, the community activities. 
So outside of, of language, you also, you'll see in my scholarship, um, you know, digital libraries discussions and ethics discussions and user experience design discussions and discovery um, process discussions. Um, of course, in information science, we, we deal a lot with metadata. And so you'll see me talk a little bit about metadata. Um, but uh, met metadata is sometimes the object of our research and therefore the focus. Um, but I have been learning that there's perhaps another perspective, and that is that metadata is the record of administrative process. Um, administrative processes have different kinds of goals and different kinds of, of activities that happen in those administrative processes. And I find that we lead through the metadata we record um, about resources. And because metadata doesn't exist without administrative oversight, it exists as part of a system, a system full of choices, often bounded by user experience, that bounded by the user experience that we seek to create or the limits of our current funding. Um, so different administrative efforts end up bringing about different sets of metadata shaped by semantics or coverage. Um, we might use fancy terms like metadata quality to cover these uh, divergent uh, scenarios. But uh, it's in this context then that my research comes out uh, um, where I'm working in between these different administrative processes uh, to expose language resources uh, that exist um, between you know current or past administrative processes that haven't fully uh, developed metadata specifically uh, for or identifying the connection to a specific language community. And so I'm looking for ways to move unstructured clues about resources into structured elements. Um, you know, we I I am excited to engage with about graphs of language identification indicators for the benefit of minority language users. So maybe these are fancy terms, but uh, I want to find ways to enrich structured information from free text and context related to the terminology used around language identification. Um, I. This involves cross language, uh, like language names are different across different languages. And for example, French uh, spoken, uh, referred to in German as Alaman, um, or in English as French, but in French it has its own autonym, right? So um, the language identity information, the information extraction from records, uh, when records exist in multiple languages or different languages, moving from free text to structured text, and in some ways this borders on uh, information classification, right? Uh, so my central question is how do we go from unstructured data to structured data in a context where we want trusted information? Uh, to answer this question, I'm pursuing research in the area and the use of SORI and weighted graphs within search processes. And I'm applying this in the context of library and archive catalogs. So uh, I'm looking for language resources that are not designated to be about a, a community, an ethnolinguistic community or a language. And I'm looking in the parts of the record that uh, would... Uh, <clears throat> you know, be more free text areas. Um, for an example, though, um, let me give you an example of Carby. <clears throat> Carby is a language of Northeast India. Um, many people today are, are who know about Carby are using the term Carby, but in the Library of Congress subject headings, it's known as the Mikur language. It has a Library of Congress classification number, but that number does not have a URI associated with it yet. In the ISO 639-3 standard, which is a standard for identifying language entities, um, it is referred to as CARBY, and it has a code of MJW. There's a second entity, a related language, in the ISO 
uh, three standard. That's Omri Carby. And it's been known as Omri Carby since 2006, which before that it was just Omri. And it's got a different code to indicate that it's a different entity. <clears throat> Library of Congress matches, uh, has some near matches for Carby, um, in Library of Congress subject headings, that is. Carby people, um, uh, the Indic people group, or uh, Carby religious practices. However, scholars who might be talking about this language might use the term Carby Car Bach or Hills Carby or Plains Carby and refer to different languages in these ways. Looking at it more in a traditional uh, graph kind of way of looking at it, we uh, uh, can see that the more cultural components are green on the right hand side and the armory carby and its related terms are purple on the bottom and then the terms related to the language carby it would be in gray um, so there's a couple of different things that we could uh, look for if we're looking across uh, records in free text or in identifiers that would determine relevance when we look at two specific resources, um, uh, a grammar of Carby, it's an award-winning grammar written by a, a student at the University of Oregon. Um, and we look at uh, a particular resource in the Library of Congress. Um, uh, it's a collection of conference proceedings. Um, a well, it's, it is a conference proceeding. It's a collection of conference papers. Um, the status of women in tribal societies, a Carby and Damasa. Neither one of these resources actually has Carby in the structured data um, related to its subjectness. So uh, the subjects there for the grammar of Carby are, are descriptive and historical, comparative linguistics, Northeast Indian languages, Southeast Asian languages, Tibeto-Burman languages, typology. But the actual language that it's about, interestingly enough, doesn't appear in the subjects. Um, and the same kind of thing happens in, uh, in the uh, resource at the Library of Congress. Links are there and my slides are, will be available from my website. Now, if we were to, to look at look for Carby across a couple of different information aggregators um, in the in the community of people who aggregate materials about languages, Open Language Archives Community is a, a consortium of, of archives that aggregate language resources. And they, they have three known resources on Armory Carby and 11 on Carby. But uh, the Glottolog has a few more. Their coverage is a little better. The Virtual Language Observatory, which is the EU Claren um, interface for discovering language resources, knows about nine items, but they don't make the distinction quite clearly between Amri, Carby, and Carby. And the same thing with the, the Google Books and WorldCat. But WorldCat has a, a rather large coverage. Um, when you type in Carby, you can get uh, about 600 items. Uh, so uh, the this just kind of shows that the, I didn't check all 600 items, but um, I did check all 38 of the, the Google books to be about um, McCure Carby. So that they, they're out on allegedly about Carby, um, but uh, whether or not they're had the right uh, Library of Congress subject heading associated with them is another qu valid question uh, still out there. So we can see that discovery is impacted by our understanding of concepts, and uh, that's one of the things that we that I'm exploring is how to develop relevance uh, for exposing these resources to searchers who are looking for things about the smaller languages of the world or the languages with the smaller populations. So. My name, again, is Hugh Patterson, and you can reach me at i at hp3.me. My website's uh, hugh for us, uh, and it's an HTTP, not an HTTPS. But um, I'm interested in discovery processes, networks and graphs, metadata, 
digital libraries, ethics, language, and user experience design. And I'm interested also in collaborating with you. So let's do something together. Thank you for supporting my scholarly activities this year. Uh, and I would appreciate the opportunity to meet many of you. Thanks a lot.